moving to oneness. Nourishing curiosity. Embracing differences. Becoming one. The desire to set ourselves free is in many of us. And today I have a wonderful person sitting in Florida, US, Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> who has dedicated all his life since he's a young boy to supporting you to just do that. Hello, everyone. I'm Maylin Elke, your host of the Moving to Oneness podcast, and please welcome with me Christian de la Huerta, all the way in Florida. I miss Florida, especially in the winter. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Maylin. Thanks for having me on the show, and I've been looking forward to, to our conversation. Yeah, everyone... Uh, I also lived in uh, Georgia for almost uh, uh, 20 years. And so when it is the time right, like right now here in Germany, it's now cool, it had snow. The best way was to get some warmth is jump into the car and drive <laughs> down to Florida and possible yeah. Miami. And because there's one beach and I'm not going to say why I drove there, but you could be <laughs> very free <laughs> yes, I, I know the one you're you're talking about. And a barely need clothes on your body. That's why uh, I loved it. And every time I was in Miami, uh, Christian, and you've uh, lived on and off there, and you lived in uh, in California and many other uh, places. And because there's a like a little bit of a vibrancy that I loved and it has because you come from a Cuba, you've been born in, in Cuba. There's a little a Cuban lifestyle. I love the music. I love to <laughs> dance to cu Cuban music. Good. What, I love that you like that. Yes. So to go dancing. Yeah. Miami was another destination. And the food, I, the list is is long. I can go on and on and on. <laughs> I love that, and, and you're right about a great place to be in the winter time for you know for those of us in the in the northern hemisphere. It's pretty much sunny all the time. Yeah, um, and it's it's just beautiful uh, the weather down here. Summer gets pretty hot and humid, but the upside of that is that you can go to the beach in the summer you can be in the in the water for hours literally and it never never gets you know too too warm or too cold it's just perfect temperature i was thinking about the dancing i was once in the dominican republics and uh they were also in the water and they would dance in the water talking about it. i loved it <laughs> I didn't want to go home anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to get back to a, a, your book title because that's a fascinating book title. And that is a desire. And I think it's an internal urge that many people on this planet have because we have lost so much of our ancient wisdom to awaken ourselves to get illuminated to um, be more and more connected to everything existing and we're searching for a way to get there and when I read your book I sensed that you had that from uh, a little uh, it's a little since you're little, you had that within you can you talk a little bit about that so people may recognize, what uh, they uh, may have had within them as well since they're a child. Yeah, you know, for me, it was, um, I mean, from now, from this is pers from current perspective, I think of it as a calling. It was a desire to to serve mm -hmm. the sacred as I've understood it in, at different points in my life, um, to to make a difference in in, in real human lives. And and it kind of manifested in different ways. Like I grew up in a very Catholic family, so in those days I thought I wanted to be a priest. 
until I realized that that religion didn't really have a lot of room for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my dad was a psychiatrist and I didn't want to go the medical path because I didn't like the, you know, the blood and the gore part of it. So I went for a PhD in psychology, um, which I was on a track to get until I discovered breath work. Um, and then I jumped tracks. I never, I never went for the PhD uh, because I discovered breath work to be so effective effective and efficient and healing at so many levels quickly and so that was you know a few days a couple of decades ago it's been over 30 years now since i've been offering breath work and it changed my life one session changed my life and you know i think i think these days i think of einstein's phrase and i'm gonna paraphrase it but that you can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness in which it was created. And so when I look at the world and all the challenges that we're facing as, as a species, any one of which just feels completely overwhelming, like what can I possibly do about you know climate change or global warming? Um, and then I just go back to myself and I think, you know, right, what can I do? I, I can continue to wake myself up and to help as many people to do the same. And, and the only way that I see is digging ourselves out of this or or pulling ourselves out of this hole that we have dug into collectively. It's a spiritual revolution. It is a change in consciousness, which will, which will impact. Like we have to shift the way we see ourselves, the way we see each other and the way we see the planet and the way that we relate to all of creation. Um, And to me, that's a spiritual revolution, which can also, we can also say it's moving towards oneness yeah it is um uh, this this searching of uh, through college or religion um i had a similar way but i also came to that uh, conclusion yeah it can be a conclusion that we do need experiences right so it is mm-hmm. not the taught subject it can get us to think when we read when we listen uh, but if you don't uh, sense a change within yourself and observe and acknowledge and become aware yeah. of what is changing in a way, then we don't uh, uh, believe it. So that's why it's a good idea, like uh, breathwork, which is uh, very powerful, right? Many, many cultures uh, use uh, breathwork. If you do, you do it yourself, right? If you good lead or some ancient healers Mm -hmm. um, or still healers nowadays, right? They use the breath to support and pull in and out uh, a change within your body. Mm -hmm. It can uh, bring back many memories and is a way of catapulting us. I think have to, like I have to think about the Iceman or other guys, right? That can be uh, remembered through the breath that they're able to stay in cold weather yeah. for such yeah. a long time and that we get energized through this or we the indians right breath work is so much a part of the evolution of recognizing and awakening our body yeah and and vin hoff who you're um mm-hmm. ref- referring to his his work is very powerful and allows us to see how we can use the breath as a way to push beyond our limits. Um, and to me, that's great and wonderful, and it's definitely helping a lot of people break through limitation. And it still feels to me like a little masculine ab- approach. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but the the way the 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 way that I practice breath work is it's a softer, more spiritual. You do it for a longer period of time. You breathe in a certain way for about an hour, an hour and a half. And amazing stuff happens. Like amazing stuff happens. Um, Mm. Like not only in terms of, I don't know anything more effective in terms of healing past trauma. And and I work with people who've experienced severe drama, uh, trauma, you know, from rape and incest and sexual abuse and victims of violent crime and just, I mean, stuff that it's hard to believe what human beings do to each other. And it gets healed. It gets healed. And and it doesn't take, you know, decades of 
rehashing the same old crap on somebody's couch with all due respect to the psychotherapy you know pr approach and practice which in the right hands with clear goals it can definitely be supportive and we all know that you can sit on somebody's couch for 10 20 30 years repeating the same old crap and nothing happens and the reason for that is that that trauma no longer lives in the head so it's been somaticized so it lives in the body and the tissues of the body so no amount of talking about it is going to really get to it uh, so it's a, it's actually a great combination i have therapists who refer people to me when they're stuck when they're stagnant um and so it's a you know it's a, it's a great the cognitive with the the more somatic approach is a great combination Mm. Yeah, if I look on my experiences myself, what I've learned through different ways of breathing and um, what I notice in other people, it is really that we have a rather flat breath because often we pulled in our air in life and wanted mm -hmm. to not be seen, to become invisible. Um, or while we were breathing and having fun, there was maybe a sound, something was said, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. was strict, like the, huh, something feels like this, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And we're start, we're in the middle, and then it gets like stopped, and then you 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 can barely uh, uh, move your breath again. And uh, once we play with the breath again, and I'm I'm like you, I like the. Um, a soft, the gentle uh, approach of finding your own rhythm of breath again that suits you and whenever you feel like it, you can play with it, mm -hmm. right? And if you want to go through yes. something and go and dig deeper, then you go and, and, and do something. Um, but it also gives back our voice. It gives back our... If we breathe into the whole body, a movement again, we can start moving. And I say sometimes we in Germany, we women are different to the Latino women, <laughs> right? They're, they have a swagger in their walk. It's already how they dance, right? The <laughs> right. hips swing, the legs are farther apart. And we in Germany, we have more a military style of, of walking with, I mean, even in the school system, 400 years, right, built on a military system. So it's more harsh. And even so, it comes from the culture, how the way how we breathe. It comes from a personal experiences, mm -hmm. right? And, and our clothing and how we're supposed to be and always by adapting. And then on top of you, Christine, you said the spiritual part. I sometimes think when we're fluid beings, Right, and we tried. Uh, I'm talking maybe now more men and women that were more mm -hmm. fluid beings, and we want to be like a, a rigid structure, like a skyscraper. So we we lose so much energy, and we need so much strength just to change our form. And so I also love to see then once someone goes into their rhythm of breathing and they become this movable flexible soft mm -hmm. uh being that everything just comes out they get their voice they again and uh become creative yeah no, so many so many ways in which we could follow that conversation because you spoke so many truth and so many you know perceptive ideas in there um i and a couple of the ones that jumped out at me was like, yeah, the, the part of the problem with with the breath and the emotions is that when when scary emotions come up, like fear, like anger, immediately we stop breathing, right? Or we start taking really shallow mm -hmm. breaths, and and that's what that's what makes those emotional energies get anchored in the body. And, and so if if one of if a listener is getting nothing else but this is like when you get upset when you're stuck in traffic and you start feeling that frustrate frustration come up or when you're about to you're in an argument and it's about to go south and you're gonna about to do or say something that you're then gonna regret take a breath right take several deep breaths <laughs> um there's swamis in india that have that much control over their body that they can tell the heart to slow down and it does some of them even mimicking states that 
are hard to distinguish from death. Most of us are never going to have that kind of deep relationship with our body, but anybody can slow down the breath. Anyone can do that. It's just having the presence and making the choice to do so. When we slow down the breath, the, the heart has no choice. The heart has to slow down. And as the heart slows down, the body begins to relax. The nervous system begins to quiet down. And we come off this defensive, um, you know, DEFCON 1 stance um, that's only going to lead to to an argument or to a, a worse argument, to a locking of horns. Um, and then we can drop into ourselves. And from a place of power, right, from that place of deeper power that that is maybe... Um, you know, soulful power, spiritually based power, um, to use my my language, we can take a stand for our truth, we can be clear, have clear boundaries, healthy boundaries, we can say what works for us, what doesn't work for us, from a place of, of you know, without needing to be in that place of reactivity and, and warlike stance. Yeah, it, it, when you speak about awakening, uh, when I read your book, or when I've listened to you, <laughs> LinkedIn. <laughs> um, it is. It's the way of being, really. It's a. It's mm. how can we observe ourselves, become aware how we react to others, our environment. How do we react uh, to ourselves, our own thoughts? And you bring so many hints of, and I love that in your book and exercises. Right, yes. your book is really a little lecture, no, not lecture. You because you even bring in movies. I love it. You you make it so real um, that anyone can uh, find a pl a place to connect to your wisdom that you're bringing mm. to the world, Christian. And, Thank you so um, much for saying that. I love I yes, that. I I love that. And then you go in depth, and then you went in. Um, Oh, that, that's what I find interesting in reading a, a, a book is then you also went and looked what words mean and where is the root of it? Yes. And just that, I think you looked at uh, the word power, the dynamic, potential. It's just what comes into my head right now, um, right? Where suddenly we say, oh, it takes away the stigma that is connected to it, to it or the cultural meaning of the times. And it leads us just by knowing what it means. I think it was more about to, to, to act, right? And mm -hmm. know what yes, one can yes, do. Exactly. Uh, that softens us. You, yes. you bring so many beautiful uh, examples of how can we soften? How can we become limber? Right. And when we're soft and limber, we're more flexible. We can go with the wind, yes. wherever it blows from, if it's strong or not so strong. But we go into that flow and yes. not just without, but also with the other human beings. We, we can sense them. We can approach closer or pull back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and so and that's so true. And and the thing is that we've been conditioned to believe that that's weakness, that soft equals weak. And so we've got this misunderstanding, this confusion about what power is and what what it means to be a man. So for example, we which which a lot of w women as they're on their journey to claim their power, they believe well, if that's what power looks like, then I have to behave that way. And so we walk around like these uncaring, unfeeling robots because we somebody decided along the way that emotions were weakness. And that, you know, especially men, since we were conditioned since we were kids, little boys don't cry. But wait a minute, let's look at that. Why is that? Why is it that only little girls cry? Because it's it's weakness? It's like, wait a minute, let's let's question that. Because there's two faulty assumptions in that. First of all, that the emotions are weakness. The, the emotions are not weak they're not strength they're not good they're not bad they're neutral like everything else in creation they're just energy how we give them voice how we express our emotions depending on that they have a good or a not so good effect um and and then if we think about you know the feminine being weak quote unquote it's like wait a minute do you want to talk about strength courage resilience ability to withstand pain 
uh, let's talk about the power of creation that resides in a, in a female body, in, in, a, in a woman's body. And, you know, there's um, a great joke. I mean, this is a story, I don't know if it's true, but it's a story that I've read about uh, Betty White, you know, the comedian who yes, passed away her. earlier this year. She's so funny, so brilliant. Um, and so apparently she was doing an, an interview with, you know, multiple celebrities, one of those group interviews, and somebody said something about having balls. And she goes, wait a minute where do we get this conception that having balls means courage? Because you thump those little things and the guy bends over, collapses in pain. You want to talk courage. You want to talk strength. Let's talk vaginas. Those things take a pounding. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, you know, uh, talking about strength, I think that's what I find fascinating. Just the vagina old healers, women healers, they would funnel. You were talking about breasts. Uh, ancient, you you they would put a person between the legs uh, and send out that energy through that. Or I have to think about um, right from Russia, they can what weight they can carry when you mm. train the muscles. And we're not being trained anymore, Christian. I think we were created weak because I had to think the weaker gender, the weaker sex, right? That that plays on it what we've been told the last few hundred years or maybe since religion took over oh, yeah i think it's more like <laughs> almost the patriarchy. two thousand years yeah. maybe even more like five even or six more longer thousand. depends <laughs> uh, where uh, right in in what culture but there is so much strength and to be taught again to use that um talking we're talking again there comes my idea uh, my thought again why did i go to miami so i can be, be walk around barely uh, closed right yes. so why is it such a bad thing nowadays because then we have to hide what our power and our strength is yeah uh, if you That's go right. furthest a bit the healers were walking naked because we're using our body to to heal the wisdom whatever comes through what comes from us if it's the heart if it's the touch yeah and um so you're right why did we start to make each other a uh, weak and sometimes it's not just the men we as mothers can also make boys i have a young I mean, he's not young 16 now. <laughs> wow. but i recognized it when uh the children were younger what uh right how mothers can restrict their son in in doing things and keeping them yes smaller tighter closer and i remember that there was one um i did in hamburg once a a seminar only men showed up it was a miniature mm. <laughs> but i remember there was uh i did some dancing and each one danced more of, of whatever tribe in their being was the one was more latino the one did more shamanic another one did more he felt like a fairy this running long light and one came from the desert in africa I was fascinated they had to find their rhythm again and also um all of them and which made me think a lot Krista, that so where did this come from and i think it came from all the teachers and uh kindergartners and mothers where we made the boys at uh, small and tiny they all were collapsed so there mm. where's your breath work comes back and i had to sing into the back or uh, uh, put energy some so around this area because it, it's not like they needed the chest but they're not mm -hmm. allowed anymore to show the chest i'm thinking a little bit about a gorilla but also to have those shoulders of men that the shoulders go to the side and expand it's really like a 360 degree and then the back can grow and and they, there's more uh to fill and maybe all of us is we need to, to be filled up more with ourselves, with the beautiful air. You probably help with many people bringing back in so each particle cell can can live its potential, go into mm -hmm. its uh, uh, original vibration, rhythm. So I learned that at that day. So it's not just us women. 
but there was an unhealthy crossover mm -hmm. and which is now with uh, many people that are working like you, Christian, in dissolving that. And I know you also writing a book or you maybe it's already done about relationships where we can cherish each other and recognize each other and let each other be whoever we are yes 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 it, I'm, I'm not quite finished with it yet but i'm probably 60 percent through mm -hmm. um and it is about so it's the next phase of the empowerment series or the calling all heroes series because i think most of us give away our power, settle, and, and settle for less in this area of relationships. So it's about how do we do relationships consciously? And I do weekend retreats. It's woven into my year-long coaching program as well. So if you are in relationship and you've, you've got those basic human needs for companionship, family, support, intimacy, sex, baby family, all those great things, then what? How do we use that container that framework of the relationship to speed up, to fast track our process of healing and transformation and evolution. And if you're not in relationship and would like to be, how do we identify and remove the subconscious patterns that have us sabotaging our relationships even before we start, even before the get-go, by falling for the wrong people, people who are not a match, by attracting people who are not available, they're already with somebody else, they live on the other side of the world, they're just not there. So we look at what's going on, like what are the subconscious patterns that sometimes have us feeling like, you know, I've, I've seen this movie before, it's the same old boring movie, just with a different actor, a different co-lead, but it's the same crap, the same arguments, the same issues coming up. So why do we do that? Why do we do the things we do? And that's what this next book is about. And, and I want to go back to what you were saying about the, the masculine and the feminine, because we all struggle with those issues, right? Masculine and feminine energies are present throughout all the entire universe. So of course, no matter what kind of body we're in, we're going to have masculine and feminine energies. And, and, it's not to put men down because, you know, men are great. Men are amazing. Men are part of this incredible creation. Uh, but it's just about finding more balance between those energies in the macro, in the world. And it has to start with each one of us. And part of what needs to do is we need to start, we, you know, misrepresenting the feminine as weakness because it isn't. Um, there's nothing weak about the feminine energies. And and by the way, you know, even though whether it's, I don't know how many, you know, five, 6,000 years of the patriarchy and this hierarchical power structure that requires that I push you down, step on you in order for me to feel powerful, uh, which is the more masculine way to do that, uh, the, the unhealthy expression of masculinity, everybody pays a price for that. Not only women, which obviously they have paid a huge price for that, but so do men. Because let's, let's look at a couple of numbers that are really interesting. The rate of um, longevity. Women in the U.S. outlive men by five years. We we'll look at it globally, it's seven years. And suicide numbers I only have for the U.S. But in the U.S., men commit suicide four times as frequently as women do. And 70% of the suicides in this country are committed by middle-aged white men, which... I think it's pretty clear. I don't think you can argue that it's the group in the world that still holds the majority of the power. So you would think, wait a minute, why isn't the most powerful group or the group that holds the majority of the power? They should have a better lifestyle. They should be living better and be happier. But no, what's, what's wrong with that picture? And I think that it's because we have this limited, limiting um, perceptions, misperceptions of what it means to be a man. And so going back to that, you know, walking around like uncaring, unfeeling robots, there's a price to pay for that. Those emotional energies that we have suppressed, and we all do, but men in particular, um, they don't just disappear because we don't want to deal with them. They get stuck in the body. And, and so what happens is we stuff and we stuff and we stuff some more. And then the next unfortunate one says something to us the wrong way and boom, volcanic, volcanic eruption causing harm to our relationships, sometimes irreversibly or suppress, 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 stuff more emotions. Those energies have to come out and they start seeping out and showing up as bodily symptoms, as disease, 
heart, cancer, yes. heart attacks, ulcers. And I think that's what the part that's connected to, to the longevity issue. Mm. Oh, we, can, we can talk for years. Um, but, but just staying now with the longevity and uh, the disease, which all have, so if we don't give voice to it or feel comfortable enough to yes. voice it, right? And uh, that's why it's so important that we live ourselves and our inspirations for others. One thing, yeah, if we are so true to ourselves, what I think we both of us Christian desire, really, we love to walk or talk. And uh, as we do that, others can synchronize Yes. Bodies, they synchronize to us. So then is this ripple effect. We change any a trauma uh, goes back. I um, have to do a, a quick jump because I remember now. Um, you said in what kind of relationship that it becomes a pattern that they're similar, mm. which again boils down uh, to how most of the time how we've grown up and what our relationships were to our parents and how we, in a way, digested it or bodily really also digested it, right? And uh, if we don't take a look at it mm -hmm. or go with, you know, with the, the flashlight or a loop, I don't know, <laughs> a magnifying glass on a little yes. adventure to find out it will not change. And that's the beautiful part, which I want to uh, give as so as an inspiration, every little nook or cell I change, that you change, that we change, changes everything else. Yeah, it's not, that's and it's not right. just one person. It that's has, right. it changes the people that were in that situation. It changes uh, the people that were in their situations, why they even acted that way. That goes even back then into ancestral work if we talk about it. But yes. it has a huge span. It goes into our schools of our children. It goes into our workplace. And in the workplace is often where uh, men, you have a little bit of this backstabbing attitude. I didn't notice as much when I lived in the US. I noticed it a little bit more. And I noticed that how my husband changed a little bit um, how, because the work environment was then a different when we came back to Germany. Mm -hmm. And so all yeah. this tightness, and yes, it makes you sick. Then it happens, accidents happen, yeah. and uh, yeah. cancer is a big one. Yeah, As you said, right? Some then say, I don't want to experience this. And the pressure of the workforce is too strong. Um, there's also bullying. We talk about bullying only, yes. you know, is, is the, in, in schools, but they have to learn somewhere, right? So, that's right. That's right. And um, so that true, takes own. us away the desire. And what I was reading uh, your book was uh, uh, some chapters again uh, last week. And then I spoke, and you had an interesting article article about uh, why in the um, camps uh, some people survived and not mm. and that the ones that survived uh, were the ones that had a passion to create had a purpose uh, were the healers that shared their bread and I took that I took that thought further I was in Bali and I saw so many things were done uh, with hands that were still producing their foods and what right and uh, they were making the baskets of gratitude each day and 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 the flowers and they blessed each other and whoever but then the, so that was all in my head all day mm -hmm. and then my son he hurt himself and we were driving back from the hospital and he said yeah one of his friends said oh he wants to die when he retires and I thought mm. oh my god and I said, oh, and I, I was got a little curious because that was also the the the, the article, um, uh, the chapter where you, you talked about the suicide. And I've met mm. a few young men that disappeared and they took their life. So I was a little curious. How does my son mm. <laughs> think about it, right? You want to nudge in, in a, a little bit. And uh, then I, I try to explain that, oh, this person really is not 
doesn't see the beauty in life or the healing and that there's every day is worth getting up and seeing something new or traveling the world. So why does a young child, or oh, 16 now, okay, or 17, so already now giving up on life, knowing he's going to give up in 60 years. Or mm. wait a minute, 40s. I thought that was rather shocking. So, what are we bringing as a society um, to pull that out of people? Why is it not something where we give hope, where we give uh, a, a children? Oh my God, I want to do this. I want to create that. Talk in your experience, Kristen. What can people do, and or what can they talk about in their life to bring again? this belief that we're worth our life is a good thing that there is we have a purpose here on this planet and to pull that out and show that it's a beautiful thing because i know yes, you and, see and, beauty of the world yes yes for sure as as do you and 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 as do all of us really if, if we just pause and and mm, get our heads out point. of the the computer screens and the and the mobile phones and look around us. Beauty is everywhere. It's like such a stunningly beautiful planet that we live in. Um, and I think part. I mean, it's, it's so tragic what you were talking about the sixteen year old, your your son's friend, that he's already kind of, you know, programming himself to die when he retires. And 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 there's truth to that. I, I forget what the numbers are, but a lot of suicides happen. A lot of deaths happen, not suicides, right after retirement. And and I think it connects to this question that we're talking about, like what is our purpose? Mm -hmm. And 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 it's part of the reason why so many men globally are struggling, because it's it's a it's an identity issue, right? Do we we there's these stereotypes about what men do and what women do. And we're living in a time where all those gender roles are being questioned and are up for grabs and being redefined. Like, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Um, and the and the trans community is really serving us, enforcing us to 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 look at those questions, even if for some of us it's challenging. Um, but there's good in that. There's good in being challenged because part of what we're talking about is that men have this identity. Like, say, for example, the provider. You know, they bring they bring home the 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 bacon. They they the ones who take care of the family. But what what happens when at least in the U.S. more than fifty percent of college graduates are women? So and the trends are only increasing, and and so and in I think forty percent, and it's probably higher now. This is numbers from like five years ago. In forty percent of heterosexual households in the U.S., women make more money than the, than their male counterparts so that whole that i think that's why so many men are struggling because their identity is so limited like are you really going to tell me that what makes you a man is the size of your uh paycheck um you know that's what a limiting way to look at yourself so part of what i did in that book is we need to redefine like all these roles and so let's look at, for example, the provider, like, all right, well, maybe your your spouse makes more money than, than you. Who cares? There's so many other ways to provide. Like, what about providing a safe environment in your home, in your family, where everybody gets to grow and, and fulfill their potential and be happy and, and explore different ways of being? That is infinitely so more, so much, so much more important than the amount of paycheck that you, the size of your paycheck, um, and the explorer, you know, which which is another one of those roles that that men have traditionally played throughout, throughout history. Well, you know, there aren't that many places to explore in this planet anymore, unless you go really, really, really deep into the ocean or out into outer space. Um, but what about exploring the world within? Right. To me, that yes. that universe that is unique to each one of us. Go explore that. Go figure out who you are and why you do the things you do. And all the answers to all our questions, to every one of our doubts is in there. So they're, they're all in there. So go explore that. To be courageous enough. Yeah. And I, I, I think man, sometimes people think they will feel so much pain or sadness. And yes, maybe you do. And, uh, but then it, that's a moment of transformation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everyone, exactly. If, uh, 
I love it nowadays when I cry, when tears run down, because I know change is coming and this moment appeared. So change and something new can be created. Yes. Yeah, this and, is and so the important. And then it's fun to, in a way, it's then yes. fun to cry because you, uh, you don't give up and you're not lost in it. That's right. You know I'm you're doing you're, you're it re- for yourself. I'm really glad you're reframing it because I think to feel the emotions and to learn how to identify them. If you asked me 30 years ago what I was feeling, I had no idea. I couldn't tell you because I had no idea what I was feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and with my father as a psychiatrist, who was also who was a good psychiatrist, I know because people have told me so who used to see him, but with his own emotions, clueless. And and so I you know I grew up that way as well. But what we're what you're what you're pointing us to is that to feel, to to know what we're feeling and learn how to communicate those feelings courageously, mm-hmm. responsibly, like owning there are emotions instead of pointing the finger and blaming the other. Um, nobody can make us feel anything, right? Unless there's a wound here in us that gets triggered by somebody's words or actions. Uh, so we gotta own our our responsibility for all aspects of our, of our lives. And, and that's not to give anybody else an excuse or rationalize what they did or didn't do. This is just to own personal accountability in our lives. Um, we may not be able to control them, but we can always manage our response and choose our response to whatever anybody says or does. And that's heroic. And that ability to communicate it courageously, responsibly, compassionately, right? Not just dumping it like a, like a two-year-old having a temper tantrum, uh, but in gracefully, in a way that it can be heard, in a way that it can be heard, it's it, that it can be received. It's the opposite of weakness. Now, I think you're, that's mastery level stuff, like courageous, heroic stuff to to develop that skill set. So the opposite of weakness. Yeah, you you speak. You give a lot of um, uh, tips about compassion and uh, gratefulness. And that's also a quick way to support uh, ourselves and uh, bring along and change. Oh, and then there was you. We were speaking right. If we're in a relationship and we decide to go on this courageous journey, share mm-hmm. it with others so they you, you they know what is happening. Maybe why you're quiet one day because you're more into uh, a re- in the reflective mode within and yeah. So they understand what's going on. If you don't want to share, let them know that you're still trying to decipher your own um, understanding right. or experience. And uh, right. because and, the and relationship I, can be so much of a growth then too, because you have yes. someone who witnesses what you're doing. Exactly. And, and I want to go back to what you were saying earlier, that it, when we work on ourselves, when we bring healing to ourselves, that that actually ripples out and makes a real difference in the world. Mm in ways that our science doesn't explain yet. Uh, But we're all interconnected, right? And and we've known this from spiritual teachings. Quantum quantum physics is starting to head in that direction, but we're not quite there yet in terms of understanding from a scientific perspective how it is that we're all interconnected. Like they've done experiments where they split the DNA and they'll do something to it here and the the other part of it, a thousand miles away, will react in exactly the same way (laughs) at exactly the same point. Not even Einstein could explain that. He called it spooky action at a distance. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's and so how does that work, right? And, and we're talking about connecting to the theme of your podcast, right? That the oneness of not only humanity, but all of life, of all of creation being intertwined. Um, we, t- let's, we can use go back to the breath as a beautiful metaphor too. Um, there's an element that we breathe that's called argon that is inert, which means that unlike oxygen, that when we breathe it in, it gets transmuted and expelled as CO2, as carbon dioxide. When we breathe in the argon, it's, it comes out exactly the same, unchanged, that, that same boring old argon that's been around for eons. So, But the beautiful part of that 
is that even though you're in Germany and I'm now in Florida, we're breathing in that same recycled <laughs> argon, that same argon that's been going around this planet for millennia. So the same argon that's going through our, our lungs right now, it's the same one that went through the lungs of, of the T-Rex and the saber-toothed tiger and, and the woolly mammoth, the same argon that went through the lungs of, of the ancient Hindu sadhus and masters and the ancient <laughs> Hebrew prophets, the same argon that went through the lung of Mohammed and Confucius and Jesus and, and Mary Magdalene and every spiritual luminary throughout history and the Buddha um, and through every amazing scientific and artistic mind, it's the same argon going through our lungs right now. I just love that. And mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, I speak often about exchanging your wisdom. So to play with the breath, right? To when we inhale it, or even when we're outside somewhere, or you know, we we drink water, but there, there is an exchange. I invite everyone to exchange and play with the breath, because we go into communication, we go into a relationship, right? Even with that uh, air or that water, which also goes on and gets uh, recycled, or uh, wherever we walk on anything we touch anything we think about, observe, right? Or you observe a bird, you go on into communication with uh, that bird because in that moment you're acknowledging it, um, right? Or get inspired. But I had to think about a story one of my teachers shared. He was invited uh, to an Inuit tribe where they went, took him under, under ice mm. and they popped open a several million old air bubble. Also, uh, yeah. where the ice had enclosed the air. Wow. So he could take a breath of that air. Oh, my God. Right? Wow. And synchronize. I'm talking a lot about synchronize. But in that moment, the body synchronizes to the better. Wow. Um, right? That's why it's, when now, when everything is melting, we're finding ancient mammoths. And they can all make medicine out of these things again. Or other trees, other other plants, other material that has um, the memory when there was beautiful balance and harmony on this uh, planet, right? And we're mm -hmm. going back to, the, I mean, we're going into the future, but we're also going back. It's when we have the communication with the cosmos. All of my listeners know I'm a big star girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's vaster. And also that if you you take your thoughts and with your air, your, the, the, your breathing techniques, right? You open us up to become bigger than ourselves and to draw from something bigger than ourselves. So we don't feel so alone. Mm -hmm. This is, um, I think, right? That's what you help yes. us. So we don't feel uh, uh, so alone and we can sense the connectivity and then That's it right. takes away a burden or uh, a weight, right? Or there's yes. also that we're being recognized and we can find, oh, I'm not the only one. And that is what also you're helping yes. with your beautiful work, Christian. Thank you so much for for, for noticing that and for highlighting that. And, and yes, that sense of aloneness is illusion. It's it's just a misunderstanding of, of the ego mind. And we don't have time. We could do a whole other hour <laughs> just talking about the ego mind. Um, but it's an illusion of separation. And what's yeah. interesting about that, that concept of connection that you're bringing up is that recent studies indicate that at the root of all addictions is that longing for connection. And so it's a really important um, conversation to be had. Um, and, and how do we reconnect with ourselves? How do we reconnect with each other? How do we reconnect with the planet, with creation? It's really, it's a, it's a question of survival. It really is that, that existential of a question. And, and to connect it one more time to the breath, um, in most spiritual traditions in the world and even several secular languages the same word can mean breath or it can mean spirit so for example from numa in, in mm -hmm. 
Greek, from that word from which we get pneumonia, that word meant both lung and soul. From the Latin spirare, from that root, we get both respiration and inspiration or expiration. Um, and on and on and on, ha in Hawaii means both ruach in Hebrew, um, atman um, in Sanskrit. Um, so there's something to atom that. Atom in right? German. It's, oh, I, I'm surprised that it is like Sanskrit. It just surprised me. How, how do you say it in German? Atom. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, supposedly Sanskrit is the, the original, the proto-language, the, the original language. Um, uh, but so, wow, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, anda, I think in Norwegian, anda is, you know, just a secular word, but it means both. Um, and so it's it's so accessible to us, right? The breath is free. Mm -hmm. It's our most loyal, <laughs> our most faithful one, yes. companion on this journey of life, on this journey of embodiment. Use the breath, access your breath. Um and and you know that to me that's what what I mean by the softer approach to the breath in my in my breath work practice. It's it's almost like you know I know the word surrender is confusing for some people. People think that to surrender means that you're giving up, you're throwing the white towel. But surrender is really where the power is, yes. um, ultimately. And that's another hour long conversation that we could have. <laughs> but what I recommend people do is just surrender to your breath. It's the breath is breathing us anyway, right? We, we're not making this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that, whether it's the intelligence of the breath, whether it's spirit, whatever it is, there's something breathing us. And so let go to that. Let use the breath to calm yourself down for inner peace, for self-discovery, for healing. It really is an incredible healing force. And I have 30 years of experience to, to with stuff that just boggles the mind, like including physical healings just from breathing. And and how is is the science there yet to explain how that works? No. Um, so I go back to that breath spirit connection. But I got stories that would just blow your mind of even physical healings just from breathing. Oh, I'm a, a big believer. I have seen it in others. I've experienced myself. As I said, even in you know two three minutes uh supporting someone with breath or sound you know i'm a lot about sound and, and yes singing. i do i do know that all uh, right so it's it's the, the the breath that goes out and we put intention really even our words and speaking and our conversation this is a way of of breathing and we put intention we put our love we put our energy we put our uh, compassion into these words because the word itself is a letter <laughs> yeah, or some pronunciation um some okay are runes but still there comes this love that each of uh of us carries yeah and this yes, is is yes. something not to forget uh you are a beautiful being out there you're here to bring light and you're here to breathe <laughs> and to yes. do greatness uh, with your work. And you're, uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> can yes, go no. on. But I want yeah. people to come to you because, uh, Chris, you're very vast. You, even in the book, you can't put all the knowledge that you carry. And I always go back to when we, you're young, but you, you're born this way. You are, or you're born as a healer. You, your energy centers, you're glowing. Everyone who can see you and just, uh, stands. So how can they connect with you or uh, find this beautiful book and other beautiful books? Yes. And thank you. you. I just want to clarify something that you said is that I, I know I always had that sense of mission, but I also know pain. Like I know self-doubt intimately. In fact, I know self-hatred. I know what that feels like. My entire adolescence was one long depression. And by using these concepts and these teachings and, and, and breath, um, flash forward to today, no matter what happens in my life, no matter the, the circumstances, whether a relationship works out or it doesn't, whether a project succeeds or it fails, in quotes, never, ever, ever do I question my sense of self. My self-worth is unshakable. 
and and that has been you know if you would have asked me that that if you would have told me that I was going to be in that state of being when I was a teenager I would have laughed that because it was so it's such a foreign concept to me uh, so I know that if that can happen in me that journey of empowerment it can happen in anybody and I know that whatever happened in our past whatever trauma we've had to overcome that it can all be healed like I know that I've seen it happen too many times uh, to question the effectiveness of of this approach. Um, and so in terms of how to reach me, thank you so much for asking that. The book is available wherever books are sold. So you can order it at your local bookstore or you can get it on Amazon or some of the other online websites where you can get books. Say the title because I didn't. Awakening the Soul of the Power. Awakening, Awakening the Soul of Power. The soul of the Power, sorry. Awakening <laughs> the Soul of Power, yes. And so in terms of reaching me, probably my website is best and that's soulfulpower.com, S O U L. F U L P O W E R dot com. And from there, they can access my social media. And for your audience, um, anybody who's listening to this and they go to my website and get on my email list, and we all know how, how easy it is to click on subscribe if it doesn't work for you down the road. Uh, anybody who gets on my email list will send them a sample chapter from the book, which talks about what it means to live heroically in, in these times that we live in what it means to be a hero in the 21st century. Um, we will send them a sample chapter I mean, of, of practices, some of the practices you were talking about that are designed to integrate the teachings mm -hmm. so that the teachings don't stay at the level of information. We don't need more information. We've got information so overload. What we need is transformation. And that only comes from really living and integrating a set of teachings into our lives. Um, and then we'll send them a guided meditation and a short teaching that I recorded in, in the worst part of the pandemic over here. And it's about how do we find a place of trust? How do we move into trust in these chaotic times of fear and uncertainty? Mm, yeah, that's so important. Um, but the most beautiful part is, which I want uh, to voice is, you said you went through a lot, you had pain. So that's why I think you're so vast because you carry these experiences. There is not one sentence, you can feel it when you read it. Mm. There is not one sentence not covered up by, uh, not, covered, not covered up, that's the wrong word. <laughs> yeah. That you have not gone through yourself. Yes, that's it. Right? That's it. I think this is something really important. And that's what uh, I sensed when I was reading. Or even now when you're speaking, you went through it and you build on it. And you, you've gone through and you have awakened your own soul. And you're way sure you, you're in a way also... Um, moving into frontiers right so other people mm. can follow that's something that is about you and um you don't go backwards you go forwards right. and this right. is uh, uh, very beautiful uh, to see and that's why i think people will be in fantastic hands thank you so hands. much for saying that and for and yeah i, I walk my talk so everything that I that I speak about, it's stuff that I that I've lived that I know from personal experience, not something that I read in another book, or that somebody I heard somebody else say. It's like it's stuff that it's lived and tested, um, not only in my own life, but the the countless number of people who have come to to my retreats. Um, and so I wanted to thank you for for the for the depth of your questions and the sensitivity of your questions. I wanted to thank you for your acknowledgement of of oh, my work. You. And I wanted to thank you for, for having me on the show and for having the show, because I know that in your willingness to do that, so many lives are touched and impact. And because we're all interconnected, that makes a huge difference. That ripples out in ways that we can't even know. So thank you so much for, for that. Thank you very much. Very touching. And uh, yes, that's my... I just knew it when I knew it was arising to just send it out so it can fly wherever it needs to fly yes. <laughs> around the globe. And so one tip that you think now in the end is we're ending uh, 2022, you will air 2023, I think the first day. <laughs> 
what do you sense is right now important? Even though we've spoken about a lot, but what comes for you for others in this moment? Hmm. Well, a couple of things. Go within. Go inside. Dive deep. Deep within. Yeah, you might have to remind or pleasant, but it is so worth it because that stuff is going to be there anyway. And it's impacting us from the subconscious, whether we want to or not. So better to face it on, heal it, and clear it from our lives. Secondly, use the breath. It is a, it's a magical, miraculous tool, and it's what allows us to not only be present um, with each other, but to 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 hit like all the healing powers that we were talking about. Um, and it's part of what helps us connect and feel connected. And then you know realize that there's a way to step into our power that doesn't have to do with hierarchy, control, fear force, domination, manipulation that doesn't require that we push anybody down and step on them or abuse them in order for us to feel powerful. There's a way to step into our power that is clean and, and that is congruent with who we are. And so just do it. <laughs> and the nice thing, we don't have it, have to do it alone anymore, right? That's there right. Enough that we can share in communities getting larger and stronger around right. the world. And we're more and more here for each other. So thank you, Christian, for being on the show and bringing your love and all of your information, especially about the breath and the encouragement to play with this beautiful free tool to explore it mm -hmm. and maybe find your own style. <laughs> mm -hmm. So everyone, try it out. Uh, when you speak with someone else in the next few moments, uh, take what you just heard integrate it and try it out and see how the other person will respond or another animal or a plant. So I'm Eileen Elke, the host of Moving to Oneness podcast, and I send you a lot of love. Goodbye.